1-800-960-9719. And now, here's your host, Kevin Conover. Bring your time. Welcome to Educate for Life. Your I'm your host. Bring You're your on Educate for Life uh, radio and, and podcast down here in Southern California. And we air on FM 96.1 in North County as well as KPraise 12, 10 a.m. But we're also all over YouTube, Facebook, uh, all the different social media outlets. And uh, we've got a fantastic show for you today. My guest has taught biology, genetics, chemistry, biochemistry, anthropology, geology, and microbiology at Northwest State College in Ohio for over 25 years. He has nine degrees, including seven graduate degrees. He's a graduate of the Medical College of Ohio, Wayne State University, the University of Toledo, and Bowling Green State University. He has over 800 publications in 12 languages and 20 books and monographs. He's taught at the Medical College of Ohio. He was a research associate there in the Department of Experimental Pathology. And he's also taught six years at the University of Toledo and seven years at Bowen Green State University. And if that wasn't enough for you, he's also a fellow of the American Scientific Association. He's a member of the National Association for the Advancement of Science, as well as many other associations. He's listed in Who's Who in America, Who's Who in the Midwest, and Who's Who in Science and Religion. Uh, boy, Dr. Bergman, I, I, I want to ask you, my first question is, what motivates you to get all this done? How do you achieve uh, what you've achieved? It's incredible. Well, I'm strongly motivated to deal with what I see clearly as the problems that Darwinism has caused in our society. And I see this as a major problem today, not just in the church, but also in science and in our culture. And so therefore, there's a lot of research out there that supports me, but I'm trying to bring it forth to the public in a readable format so they can read it and benefit from my research as well as that of others. Absolutely. And it seems to me frequently the problem isn't not having the truth, it's getting the truth out there. Would you say that's uh, that's true? Oh yeah, it's there. I mean, I'm just doing a paper now on the, the origin of lungs in invertebrates. In and we have no theory, no theory that's even viable. And the theories that Darwin put forth 150 years ago are quite clearly simply not true. And so, in fact, we haven't progressed really since Darwin's ideas about where lungs, human lungs came from. And this information is there. It's not hidden, but it's not commonly brought forth in the popular media. Yeah. So, um, you know, you, you've written a lot of books um, and you're re working on a book right now. What's the latest book you're working on? Well, I have two books which should be out any day now. One is called uh, Darwinism is the Doorway to Atheism, and the next is called Science is the Doorway to Christianity. And I show how important science is in leading one to Christianity, and this book has about 60 cases of people who came to Christianity, who came to the faith in Christ as a result of studying science, which we're not that familiar with that uh, conclusion, but indeed there's many, many people who have come to faith through that approach. And the other one, Darwinism or Evolution, I'm not sure what the final title is. You write a book and people think that the author makes all these decisions, but they don't, the publishers do. But probably it'll be Evolution is the Doorway to Atheism. And I show indeed where in all the cases, these were professed Christians who became atheists as a result of studying uh, evolution, Darwinism. Wow. And, you know, like you said, um that this is not a common thought. Most people will say, hey, the more you, you study science, the less you need faith. They say, you know, you have faith in Christianity um, because you don't understand how the world works. And as we learn more about science and everything, we no longer need uh, the solution to be God. Um, how, you, how would you respond to somebody who said something like that? Well, it's said that a little bit of knowledge about science can lead one into atheism. More knowledge, greater knowledge, though, will lead them into theism and Christianity. And so, and that's, I, I don't know who said that first, but I appreciated that when it was mentioned to me somewhere, some book. Yeah. And basically, it's very true. A, a little bit of knowledge can be a problem. So, uh, Dr. Bergman, um, what about you? What about your own story? Um, did you grow up in a Christian family? What caused you to uh, pursue science? You have an unusual background. You have a you have a background in both the social sciences as well as the hard sciences. It's a very unusual uh, combination. Um, what, what was your background growing up, and how did you end up uh, pursuing these interests? My father was an atheist, and so I was grow, grow up in that home environment. And I went to college, and I then was convinced that evolution and thus atheism is correct. And I had a superficial knowledge, and it appeared to me 
I mean, correct. When I looked at the pictures in my paleontology book, it basically showed the evolution of man from a monkey. And I looked at those pictures and I thought, well, gee, there it is. There's the evidence. So obviously we evolved from monkeys because there we got the proof for it. Well, as I studied more and more, I realized that that was a simplistic conclusion. And I realized that this claims that they made were simply today we recognize we're wrong. In fact, I'm working on a book where we, my co-author and I, analyze carefully the evidence for evolution and find there's simply no evidence at all for the evolution of humans from any primate ancestor. And this is just by quoting the scientific research. We don't quote anything else, just the science. And it's very clear, indeed, that the evidence is there, that indeed we didn't evolve from some pre-human uh, ape. So one of your books that you wrote, uh, one of the books you wrote was strictly on one of the arguments for evolution, which is vestigial organs, that we have leftover organs from our evolutionary past, and uh, this is evidence that we have been evolving. But you wrote a whole book debunking this idea. Um, what are some of the, the areas you cover in the book in which you show that vest vestigial organs are still fraudulent? I mean, I, I just prior to the show, I Googled um, vestigial organs, and up come all these articles on, oh, here are some of our vestigial organs, here's this, here's that. And for a lot of people, they look at this and they go, well, I, I, that's a pretty good argument, and I think it's true. What, what, what would you say to that? It seems to be. My book, which just came out, which is called Useless Organs, it's now on Amazon, although they don't have any copies yet because it just came out. But anyways, this book, basically, I show that, indeed, all the claims, every single claim of a vestigial organ by the science literature is not true. They all have a function. Even some of those organs, like the Vomer bone organ, which they said had no function. Now we just in the past few years discovered that the vomer nasal bone indeed does have a function. It's, it's by the vomer bone. That's why they call it that. But anyways, well, I originally titled the book from a, from a hundred to none. And the publisher thought, you know, that's kind of a long title. Let's simplify it. <laughs> so they titled it basically uh, useless organs. And the book basically is from a hundred useless organs to none. Now, if you follow the literature, there is no, viable claim of a useless organ. They all have functions. And my conclusion came from the scientific, peer-reviewed scientific literature. They all have a very important function, or at least an important function. So give us some examples of a couple of these that, that uh, are common that our listeners would be able to uh, maybe use in their discussions with somebody. Well, one of the most common is the good old appendix. And the appendix has been called vestigial for decades, and it's still on websites called vestigial. Well, now we know the appendix has not one function, but five different functions. And one of the most important functions discovered recently is it's a safe house for bacteria. When you take antibiotics or have diarrhea, you eliminate a lot of the important bacteria. Well, the bacteria in the appendix in that safe house is protected, and therefore it can re be released after diarrhea or use of antibiotics. And as a result, it repopulates the intestinal tract, and you get back to where you need to be in a Few, few hours, and therefore this is, has an important function because now we realize that a critical aspect of health is the commensal bacteria in your gut, and they need to be there, and if they're not, you have some problems. And so this replaces it very rapidly, and it's a rather ingenious design, a way of dealing with the problem, which uh, for, for a long time didn't believe was a problem, but now we understand it is as we learn more about the body. Wow, okay, so... So as, um, you know, scientists are becoming aware that, hey, the, the appendix has a use, I believe the coccyx was another one, is that right? Right, yeah, that's another one. That's part of the tail. They call it the tailbone, which really, it's a bone which helps support your internal organs. It's a attachment for muscles and tendons and ligaments, etc. So it has a number of functions, and uh, the main one is support. So if somebody says to you, um, well, that's a leftover organ of, you know, that's our leftover tail, um, what would you say to somebody who, who said that? Well, I'd say that there's no, it's no relationship with the tail. There is not the same design as a tail. It's not in the same place as a tail. And indeed, it has very different and important functions that tails do not have. So you can't wiggle it. There's no muscles connected to it to, to allow the os coccyx itself to wiggle as there would be in a tail. So... It's a very different design for a very important reason. Okay, so another one that, that I hear frequently people bring up is they'll bring up things like 
um, wisdom teeth or tonsils and they'll say, hey, we don't need these anymore. Um, we can live without these. You'll hear people say this frequently. We can live without these. Therefore, they're vestigial. They're, they're left over from our evolutionary past. Um, if you if you are interested in uh, hearing the answers to these questions, stay with me. This is Dr. Jerry Bergman. We're coming up on a break here, and he is an expert uh, in demonstrating that Darwinian evolution is false. He's been doing this for a very long time. Um, he has eight, over 800 publications in 12 languages and has taught all kinds of classes, uh, both hard sciences and uh, what we would typically call uh, the social sciences and has a lot of experience here. So stay with us. We're going to be right back and continue to get answers from Dr. Jerry Bergman. Hi, this is Jason Hall, president of Team Home Loans, a branch of Synergy One Lending. I just want to take this opportunity to thank Kevin Conover for the profound impact he's had on mine and my wife's spiritual life, as well as being an incredible teacher while our kids were his students. His knowledge and passion have taught us all how important it is to be defenders of our faith. It is our sincere hope and prayer that you will continue to learn to be defenders of your faith through Kevin's radio show and through his Educate for Life teachings. Thank you, Kevin, from the Hall family and Team Home Loans. If you need to buy an affordable, reliable used car, truck, or even an enclosed trailer, call Conover Tires Wheels and Service in Oceanside. For tires and car repairs you can trust, call Dan Conover and his team at 760-439-1631. Honesty, integrity, and quality service. They're ASE, BBB, and NAPA certified. And they're proud supporters of Educate for Life. Learn more at ConoverTires.com. Check out their great reviews, 760-439-1631. How can you live in San Diego and miss out on enjoying the water? Fast Lane Kayaking sells popular Hobie Cat kayaks that you pedal, not paddle. That means your hands are left free for fishing and fun. They're light and they're easy to use and maintain. Just rinse them off. Try one free on a demo ride. For 36 years, Ron and Debbie Lane have served San Diego with fun, family-friendly water sports of all kinds. Learn more. FastLaneSailing.com. 619-222-0766. Thanks for listening today. This is Educate for Life. I'm your host, Kevin Conover. And if you're concerned about your children having a strong faith, uh, please check out my website, educateforlife.org. We've got over 40 online classes there that cover everything you can imagine, all the different questions that people have in a skeptical society. Our culture is more skeptical than ever before, and uh, people want to know answers to the questions. Who put the Bible together? How do they select what books go in the Bible? How do we know the Bible hasn't been changed? What about creation and evolution? What about all the different religions in the world? There's a lot of questions that kids are having to deal with Uh, as they meet their peers in school or on their sports teams or relatives. And we're coming up on the holidays here with Thanksgiving and Christmas. And this is when a lot of people, you know, get into these sorts of discussions. And it's a great opportunity to uh, use that resource, my website. Um, Check it out. And uh, hopefully it's encouraging to you. Um, Today, my guest is Dr. Jerry Bergman. And uh, he is an expert in biology, genetics, biochemistry. He's been doing this for a very long time, over 25 years. And um, Dr. Bergman... Uh, when we left off, I was asking you, uh, you know, you'll hear people say wisdom teeth are an example of a vestigial organ. That's why we can pull them out. You know, we don't need them. They're crowding out our teeth. Um, they might talk about tonsils and how so many people have their tonsils taken out. Um, what would you say to somebody who says, hey, we can live without these, therefore they're vestigial? Well, we can live without a lot of organisms. That doesn't mean they're useless. We can live without a spleen, or at least some people can. We can live without one kidney. Some you know, people can. Of course, if that kidney becomes damaged, then you have a problem. You need the other kidney. Mm -hmm. But because we can live without it, it doesn't in any way prove it's vestigial or has no use. And a good example is the wisdom teeth. When uh, people say, well, what do they do? Well, like like all other teeth, they chew food and they're useful to have. (laughs) And they also are a support structure. Now, the reason we have problems with wisdom teeth is primarily because our jaw is smaller than it used to be in the past, partially because we don't chew the coarse food that we used to in the past. So when you have a coarser diet and healthier diet, 
you generally have a larger jaw and therefore you can keep all of your wisdom teeth without a problem. But now in our days, most food, you don't even have to chew. It's very soft, tender, and therefore teeth are less used now than they used to be. And therefore, sometimes you get impaction with the wisdom teeth, which can be a problem. Occasionally, you, for other reasons, of course, you have a small jaw, which could be inherited. So you have a problem with impaction. But nowadays, they try to keep, if they can, try to keep the wisdom teeth. In fact, they call it one uh, technique, prophylactic removal. And now they realize that that is not a very good idea. Prophylactic removal is where let's take them out when you're young and tell they, so you don't have to worry about taking them out when you're older. So they take them out in preparation for the eventuality that they may become impacted. But that now we know is very foolish. In fact, there are some excellent articles in the dental journals which say that that was a huge mistake. You need to keep them in there if there's a problem. Do what you can to save them. If you can't save them, well, they may have to come out. But on the other hand, we find we can save a large number of wisdom teeth without the problems that we uh, anticipate they, they would have, and we now find out they don't. So prophylactic removal is not a very good idea at all. Okay. So, um, so they're not vestigial, and um, you know we use them. But on the other hand, if somebody said to you, well, Dr. Bergman, isn't that evidence of evolution that over time, because we're not um, chewing these more coarse foods, um, our jaws are becoming smaller, and that right there is the process of evolution taking place on a small scale. Um, how would you respond to somebody who said something like that? Well, if it's evolution, it's not progressive evolution, it's de-evolution. And so, yeah, we, I think because of the uh, atom fall, we do, I think, have evidence of degenerative evolution, but that's not what Darwinists need. They need progressive evolution. But that's what we see as part of the creation fall, and therefore, yeah, you do see uh, degenerative evolution, but that's not what we're looking at when we look at Darwinism. We're not getting better, we're getting worse, is what you're saying. Right, and that's well recognized in the medical community because I uh, taught at a medical school for a while. I have three degrees from medical school, and focus was degeneration and how we use medicine to overcome that degeneration. So mm -hmm. that was a part of the curriculum that we understand that we are not getting better, we're getting worse, and therefore, as in the medical field, we need to respond to that by medicine, by surgery, by other techniques. So that's well recognized in the medical field. In fact, there's about 5,000 different mutations that cause disease that we're fully aware of. We're not aware of any mutation that causes a clear benefit. We have some that are iffy, but on the other hand, mutations, which is the source of genetic variety that evolutionists stress, that is not a way of producing better things. It produces things that are degenerative. Now, that, that's so interesting to me because uh, my daughter has cystic fibrosis. And when we, um, when we got out of the hospital after the baby was born, they asked us to meet with a geneticist. And she started explaining all these mutations to me. And I said to her, um, I said to her, what good mutations are there? You know, knowing what I, a little bit of what I know. And um, she sat for a minute and then she said to me, you know, I can't really think of any. She said, but I'm sure they're there because that's how we evolved. And... Uh, uh -huh. And so I thought it was so ironic that she had never really even thought about it. Um, and here she's a geneticist, but she had never put that, uh, you know, put those things together and drawn the conclusion that, hey, maybe evolution is false. Yeah, she said more in her answer, I think, than she expected to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I went on and I asked her, I said, so if there was somebody that had no mutations in their body, would they be very, very healthy or very, very unhealthy? And she said, well, I've never had that question asked to me before. She said, but I think they would probably be very, very healthy. And again, I just thought, wow, that's amazing. Here we are, uh, you know, having this discussion and coming to these conclusions. When you go out and you talk to people about this sort of information, uh, Dr. Bergman, um, you know, secular scientists, those who don't believe in the Bible, um, how do they respond to you? Uh, do you see people... Um, shifting towards creation, believing in an intelligent designer and a creator? Oh, yeah. Once they have more knowledge, but like your geneticist, she had a superficial knowledge, and therefore she assumed that the source of evolution is mutations, which, of course, is widely believed. But once she has more knowledge, which she did in studying genetics, she realized that there are no examples of clear beneficial mutations. Now, there are some beneficial mutations, but they're not evidence of progression, they're evidence of degeneration, which I could go and explain, but it would be kind of hard to do on a 10-minute yeah. radio show. Yeah, <laughs> very technical. Um, so, so, Dr. Bergman, um, 
you know, some people, I'm sure, they, they listen to these sorts of conversations and they think to themselves, yeah, but does this really have any real world co consequences? You know, this is a debate that people have, but um, you've recently written a book um, on the impact of Darwinism on uh, society, on culture. Um, can you touch on that a little bit? What what real world impact does it have when somebody believes in, evol in evolution and Darwinianism versus, um, you know, uh, Christianity and God? Well, there are quite a bit of impact. I could spend three hours on this easily. But I'll give you what I think is one of the best examples is, and that is World War II was a war against creation and evolution. And fortunately, creation won, and that's why we are where we are today in America. If evolution won, about half of us probably wouldn't be here, and the rest of us would be speaking German. And therefore, critically, that issue is important. Now, when I bring that out, people, you know, very, they question that. They say, how could that be true? Well, that's why I've written a book on Eisenhower, uh, which is on Amazon and all the websites and so on. And I basically, in that 180-page book, I didn't document, indeed, how that was true. And Eisenhower was very clear about where he came from. He believed we were all created by God. We are all equal. We're all descendants of Adam and Eve. And therefore, the, the evolutionary worldview, the, in this case, the uh, Nazi worldview, that we're not all equal, that some races are better than others, is wrong. And that was a major motivation that uh, Eisenhower used in fighting the war. In fact, he often said he hates war as one who has seen it, hates it. Said, no one could hate more, war more than I do. But he said, I hate the Nazis and what they're doing even more. And therefore, he was the supreme Allied commander during World War II, and it was his work and ingenious decisions that basically allowed us to win World War II. And therefore, we're talking about creation against evolution, and creation won. Wow, that's, that's really powerful. Um so uh, I'm, I'm looking at the book on Amazon right now. If you're listening, this is Dr. Jerry Bergman, uh, who's on the program with me today. And uh, he has written numerous books, uh, either proving evolution wrong or answering specific questions about evolution. He's uh, written this book here about God and Eisenhower's life and how his belief in God impacted uh, his view towards the Nazis and towards uh, Hitler and these sorts of things. Um, you can check these all out on Amazon. And uh, we're going to be coming right back. And I want to talk about also a couple other things. I want to touch again, um, Dr. Bergman, on how you see Darwinian evolution impacting our culture today, um, here in our society today. But also, uh, you, you wrote a book arguing that C.S. Lewis was not a theistic evolutionist, as is popularly thought, but actually was an advocate for creation um, and when we come back, we'll continue to this discussion with Dr. Jerry Bergman. And, uh, and uh, so we'll be right back. Stay with us. Save money by taking good care of your car. Call Conover Tires, Wheels, and Service in Oceanside. Locally owned and operated since 1991 with all the brands you trust. See their great customer reviews and special offers at ConoverTires.com. Dan and his team are proud to support Educate for Life with Kevin Conover. They even sell affordable, reliable used cars and enclosed trailers. Conover Tires, 2405 Oceanside Boulevard, 760-439-1631. Educate for Life helps you build your life on the rock. LG Equipment helps builders build on good soil. Luke Gibson's team at LG Equipment is your local source for grading, demolition, hauling, and more. Learn about their bulk water services from trucks to tankers to towers at rentwatertower.com. Get your questions answered. Call LG Equipment at 619-988-0924. Learn more at lgequipment.com. 619-988-0924. Life insurance is like a parachute. If you don't have it when you need it, it's too late. When your family faces a challenge, you don't want to face liability because you're uninsured or underinsured. Decades of San Diegans have trusted Jim Kelly of Kelly Insurance Agency and Allstate to insure homes, cars, businesses, and lives, no matter where they live throughout California. Your family's needs are always changing. Call to schedule a checkup today. Call Jim Kelly and his team right now, 619-562-9199. Hey, 
Hey, thanks for being with us today. I hope you've enjoyed the program so far. Uh, I think um, Dr. Bergman has a wealth of information. Um, you can go to Amazon or uh, a variety of other uh, bookseller websites to get his books. He has a ton of books that will help educate you and your kids and, and your family about how to respond to a lot of the issues that are popping up in today. He's answering real world questions that are applicable to your life today and are things that come up in discussions. And um, I think it's really interesting, Dr. Bergman, you said that, that uh, you're writing a book, uh, I think you're currently working on a book uh, with 60 people who actually um, came to the Lord through the study of science. Is that right? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of people will say, um, what is the point of apologetics? Why is it important? But uh, because a lot of people say, hey, you know, you have to lead people to Jesus um, and, and not get argumentative with people or divisive with people. How, how would you respond to somebody or how would you emphasize the significance and importance of apologetics and apologetics as it relates to things like science and so forth to somebody who, who is not uh, convinced of that? Well, it's not hard to convince people of the importance of apologetics because we see a hemorrhage of the church today. We see that the largest growing religion in this country is the atheist and what they call the nuns. That means no religion. Mm. It's up to 20% now. It used to be 2 or 3%. Now it's up to 20%. And one main reason that these people accept this worldview is because they are convinced that indeed God didn't create us, that we evolved through natural selection of mutations, and therefore... What point is there in believing in God? There's no reason. He's out of a job. And when you look, though, at the evidence, you find that, indeed, he's, God's not out of a job. In fact, as time goes on, we learn more about the world around us. God has an even greater job than we thought before. And therefore, this helps us understand, as the scriptures say, of course, the heavens declare the glory of God. And it stresses we are without excuse. And when you study the natural world, the in-depth I'm talking about, you see that that is indeed true. And so many, even Christians, about 80%, according to a recent Gallup poll, 80% of all Christians are some form of creationism, except this worldview. But unfortunately, many, their knowledge is superficial. And as a result, when they go to college, so many become evolutionists. In fact, when I taught at the several colleges, uh, my colleagues often said that we should be trying, we as professors should be trying to make the students as much unlike as their parents as possible. And parents know this, that kids come home from college and they're a different person, yep. unfortunately, in many cases. And so therefore, a helping them understand these issues before they go to college is critical, or sending them to a Christian college would uh, be one way of dealing with this problem. But a lot of kids say, oh no, I've got strong faith, no problem, I'll go to college and I'll resist their indoctrination. But all too often, it's hard to resist the indoctrination of professors because most are very intelligent people. Most can articulate their worldview quite well. And if you hear the same thing in class after class after class, you're going to accept the idea that indeed God didn't create us, but we evolved from, as they say, from the goo to you by way of the zoo. And that doesn't sound very scientific, but that basically is a scientific explanation of where humans came from, yeah. from the goo to you by way of the zoo. <laughs> That's great. Uh, now, you, um, you recently also wrote a book in 2017, Evolution's Blunders, Frauds, and Forgeries. And um, you write here, it says, uh, National Geographic recently proclaimed a hybrid fossil as an ideal intermediate between birds and dinosaurs. And their forced retraction of this glued together monstrosity was barely noticeable. Disturbingly, uh, secular work is, is uh, especially in the life sciences, there, we are in a grip, in the grip of an unprecedented epidemic of scientific fraud. Um, so, what's going on here? Because uh, I, I actually um, subscribe to a website. It's a, it's not a Christian website. It's called Retraction Watch, in which they identify um, scientific fraud in, in you know, uh, out there, out and about in the journals and so forth. And you're saying we're, we're experiencing an epidemic proportion of this. Um, oh, can yeah, we are, and that's an excellent website, by the way. Although there's thousands of examples, so you get buried shortly and try to read the uh, excerpts on there. But anyways, that's the, there's several reasons for that. Is One is more and more professors, they don't get paid by the university directly. They survive their job by getting grants. To get a grant, you have to have some evidence your research is turning out. And so when you're close, let's say I'm 
you know, a couple of points away from a good study compared to a failure study, you know, you just forge a couple of points and I'll get the money next year and I continue to do research and I can support my family. I don't have to worry about moving and so on. So there's strong motivations in our society to cheat slightly to get the money. And of course, especially towards evolution because scientists are concerned about proving evolution and hey, you just bend the facts a little bit and here you go. You got proof of evolution. Now, some of this bending is not deliberate. It's, it's because they see the world they want to see and therefore they have what they call evolutionary glasses on and these Glasses distort reality. But nonetheless, for whatever reason, there is a lot of distortion of science. And as a result, science hurts. In fact, one thing I stress what the work I'm doing is, is science is critically important and we must be honest, etc. And we must not bend it to prove our theory like evolution. And in doing that, we're, we're affecting adversely science as well. Because people are starting to doubt science as well. They're starting to uh, you know, not put their trust in it. I noticed uh, even some of the fraud that was uh, committed on the Retraction Watch website had to do with cancer research, which is uh, devastating to people who are, you know, their lives are literally hanging in the balance and then uh, they find out this, you know, stuff is fraudulent. Which illustrates my point that this hurts science. Evolution hurts science as few other theories has hurt science. And global warming is another problem where there's, of course, concerns, but on the other hand, they're all too often greatly exaggerated, like this congresswoman who says, well, we've got 12 years left and the world's going to end or some... That's right, prophecy. yeah. And that hurts science. It really hurts science, and it hurts... People are concerned about science because science is the doorway to God, and therefore we, we need to be a credible society helping people understand science to lead them to the Creator. And this, unfortunately, hurts not just us Christians, but it also hurts the scientific community. Now, it's interesting, um, you know, I was talking to another fellow not too long ago who said that he sees a rise in the theistic evolution, the idea that God used evolution. And um, you wrote a book specifically on C.S. Lewis uh, saying that he was not a theistic evolutionist. Uh, can you share with our listeners a little bit about um, your motivations behind writing that and, and what you found? Well, I found in looking and studying Lewis that he was not only not a theistic evolutionist, but he was a militant, anti-Darwinist Christian. And he realized that he's not a scientist. He debated a scientist as a student once, actually, and he, he lost. He, he realized that, to be credible, I cannot debate something I don't know a great deal about. So therefore, he criticized and attacked evolution, but not by science. He therefore criticized it through his stories, through his literature, through his trilogies, through his writing, his writing, even poetry, was very effective in showing, indeed, that evolution cannot be true. And so he was effective, but a lot of people assume, because he never really attacked uh, evolution by science, they assume, incorrectly, un that he was a theistic evolutionist. And in no way was he, and that's how he was able to get a, what, a 200-page book showing, indeed, eloquently, that he was not a theistic evolutionist, and indeed, he was a very strong creationist. But again, he stayed out of the, the, the science area. He he looked at other areas, especially through his literature, through his trilogies. And so it's there. I mean, he's very clear in what he said. In fact, even when he, even before he became a Christian, he talked about the harm that Darwinism has done. And he, indeed, was very clear throughout his life in the concerns in this area. But unfortunately, so many people, Christians, believe that he was a theistic evolutionist because they are, and they want an excuse to accept the theistic evolution worldview, and they say, well... C.S. Lewis was a theistic evolutionist, so I, I must be okay. Yeah. But indeed, if they understood him, they would realize that he was not a theistic evolutionist. So if you want to check that out, you can check it out on Amazon. Uh, Dr. Jerry Bergman, just type his name into uh, Amazon, uh, B-E-R-G-M-A-N, and all kinds of books are going to come up that will help you to get a better understanding of science and God and, and so forth. And um, Dr. Bergman, um, you know, something we haven't touched on really is uh, your background, you have a background in the social sciences. Um, you have been involved in, um, you're a professional counselor also. Um, I don't know how you have time for all these things, but but uh, it's fantastic. And um, you, maybe we should do a show on time management sometime with you. I think that, that would be a very productive yeah. show. <laughs> That'd be fine. Yeah. So, um, but when we come back, we have one more segment left. I'm going to talk to uh, Dr. Bergman specifically about um, why he is motivated in the social sciences as well as the hard sciences, and then also 
um, talk a little bit more about some of the most powerful arguments that uh, that debunk evolution and um, ultimately why he chose to become a Christian in college and left atheism behind. Um, so stay with us. We're going to be right back. We're with Dr. Jerry Bergman. Luke Gibson of LG Equipment supports Educate for Life with Kevin Conover. Luke grew up in the construction industry and now serves LG's commercial and residential customers throughout Southern California. Whether you need grading, paving, hauling, demolition, on-site bulk water service, water trucks, tankers, and towers, call LG Equipment at 619-998-0924. Learn more at lgequipment.com. 619-998-0924. Hi, this is Jason Hall, president of Team Home Loans, a branch of Synergy One Lending. I just want to take this opportunity to thank Kevin Conover for the profound impact he's had on mine and my wife's spiritual life, as well as being an incredible teacher while our kids were his students. His knowledge and passion have taught us all how important it is to be defenders of our faith. It is our sincere hope and prayer that you will continue to learn to be defenders of your faith through Kevin's radio show and through his Educate for Life teachings. Thank you, Kevin, from the Hall family and Team Home Loans. Life insurance is like a parachute. If you don't have it when you need it, it's too late. When your family faces a challenge, you don't want to face liability because you're uninsured or underinsured. Decades of San Diegans have trusted Jim Kelly of Kelly Insurance Agency and Allstate to insure homes, cars, businesses, and lives, no matter where they live throughout California. Your family's needs are always changing. Call to schedule a checkup today. Call Jim Kelly and his team right now. 619-562-9199. us today. This is Educate for Life. I'm your host, Kevin Conover, and we are airing down here in Southern California in San Diego. We're on K-Praise 1210 AM, as well as FM 96.1 in North County. And uh, we're also all over YouTube. We're all on Facebook, everywhere. So um, you can ch check out all kinds of shows. We've got a great show coming up uh, next week. We've got a, a brief interview with Bethany Hamilton. Uh, she uh, was the pro surfer who lost her arm to a shark but didn't give up and is still a pro surfer, surfing uh, huge waves. Uh, she recently came out with her second move me movie, and uh, so we'll have a chance to talk to her. And we've got all kinds of interviews up with amazing people doing amazing things. Um, uh, also have an interview online with Dr. James Tor, uh, who also proves that evolution is impossible. He's an organic synthetic chemist. And our guest today is also an a incredibly well-credentialed scientist, um, you can check out all his credentials online uh, at Logos Research Associates and other sites. But um, Dr. Bergman, um, you you became a Christian in college. Um, what was the point at which you finally decided, you know what, evolution is false, atheism is false, and you turned your life over to God? What what happened? Well, I didn't have a Pauline conversion on the way to Damascus, but what happened with me is like, the water in front of the dam builds up higher and higher and higher, and finally it gets to a point where it overflows, and that would be what we call the born-again experience. Mm. So finally you come to a point where you realize that the evidence is overwhelming, and therefore you give your life to Christ and follow the Christian way. How, and, uh, how did your parents respond to you when you decided to become a Christian, your father being an atheist? Well, he wasn't too happy at all. Of course, he, he, uh, he, he wasn't happy at all. He was a secular humanist and very involved in the Democratic Party and very involved in pushing ideology that indeed is contrary to the Christian ideology and so but you know we got along pretty well I just learned not to argue with him and just talked about other things we had a lot in common we had a lot of concerns about ecology and the environment and so on and so you know those were things we had in common and and he helped me get through college I worked for a company that he owned and that's w the way I paid my way through college so I work one day a week and I was able to go through college and get my, actually, my, all my degrees. I'm nine degrees, and the first three degrees, it took me nine years. 
I started out with a uh, entering college and worked at college until I graduated with my doctorate degree nine years later. Gotcha. And then now your degrees, um, your your background in counseling. Um, why did you pursue both, you know, the social sciences as well as the hard sciences? What was going on there in your in your mind and your heart? Well, I've I've always had a lot of interest in many areas, and even today I still have interest in many other areas because if you study biochemistry all day, you, you know, after a while you <laughs> you get kind of bored. <laughs> That's funny. You need to get into something else. So yeah. I have a, a, quite an interest in history. I had a minor in history, and I did. Uh, for my doctorate degree, I had more hours in psychology than I did in measurement, which was the major area that I got the degree in. And I went on, as you mentioned, I went on and uh, worked for a psychologist uh, under uh, under Dr. Busset, actually, and he trained me, and I had uh, three years experience, and that was necessary, a clinical experience was necessary to get licensed. I became licensed, and I worked uh, as a clinician at Arlington Psychological Associates. And I worked for so long, but after you've seen the ninth paranoia patient <laughs> and then and the main the main problem I worked with were people who are depressed mostly women and the major problem in their lives was not surprisingly they're men their their husbands their boyfriends their, their father etc so after a while you get burned out because you you only work with so many different types of clients and uh, I just want to go on and do other things yeah and so I went on and did other things although I taught psychology and my Clinical experience was invaluable because in class I was able to relate the experiences I had and the people I worked with and how I helped them and so on. And they find that, of course, very rewarding relative to uh, the course. And I taught normal psych and general psych and other psych courses, so that was very helpful. Psychology, there's two branches really of psychology. There's a theoretical, the, the guesstimate type, and then there's also the empirical type where you do research. And I was interested in the empirical type where you work with... Uh, doing evaluations, using MRI, and so on. But these, uh, part of my background was psychology, and I, so as that, many young people, that's one of my interests. That's really interesting to me because this gives you a perspective that a lot of people probably wouldn't be able to have in actually assessing how what you believe impacts, um, you know, your life on an individual basis and then on a larger basis also. So you wrote this book specifically about how how Darwinian evolution impacts society. Do you think that your background there was able to give you a deeper insight into into that fact? Oh yeah, because uh, the bi the biological area, specifically Darwinism in this case, does affect how you believe things like abortion. And it may surprise people to know, but when the U.S. Supreme Court ruled on abortion, it basically utilized an idea developed by Ernst Haeckel called ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny which basically says in the womb, we literally go through our evolutionary stages. So we start out in the early stage as a goo, and then we end up a fish, and then we go through the stage of the evolution that we supposedly went through and we're evolving a long time ago. And they convinced, to some degree, I think probably highly convinced, the U.S. Supreme Court that indeed when abortion occurred, we were at that stage fish. And therefore, you're not aborting a human, you're aborting a fish. Wow. And that I, was widely accepted for many years. I have never heard that before. That's incredible. Um, you know, what's interesting to me about that is that just last year, um, and I teach at a Christian high school, I had a student bring to me um, their AP Bio textbook, and they showed me in the textbook where it has um, a human embryo, and it has arrows pointing to... Uh, the folds in the neck of the embryo, and it says gill slits. Um, yeah. And I, it's uh, unbelievable to me. This this was uh, debunked, wasn't this, uh, in the 1800s, I believe. Wasn't that the case? Oh, yeah, it was debunked a century ago. But recently it came to the attention of the public because Dr. Richardson did a study where he photographed actually what those embryos looked like at the stages that Heckel had drawings for them. And he showed that Heckel's drawings were way, way off base. It's not just exaggeration, but... He drew pictures that were so wrong that you would know there's there's something wrong, and they call this a forgery. And so now that's widely known. In fact, many of the textbooks, not all, but many of the textbooks have taken out this ontogeny recapitulation phylogeny of Ernst Haeckel of the book, and therefore um, it's more widely recognized that that's not a good argument. I think if this if the abortion case came before the Supreme Court again, I have a strong feeling that indeed they would rule the opposite that they ruled twenty. 
25, 30 years ago. And therefore, abortion would have a much more difficult time getting through because we have more science. We have uh, sonograms, for example, and you can see the, at those certain stages, you can see what the baby looks like. And that has revolutionized our whole view of life in the embryo. And today, if it was before the Supreme Court, I have a feeling, as many people are very, very worried about, the leftists, I'm very worried that indeed it would be overturned, and I think there's a good chance it would be overturned, or at least part of the abortion law would be overturned, so that states could outlaw abortion or discourage it in some way if they wanted to. So as we become more scientifically literate, we gravitate towards the Christian, towards a biblical worldview. Yeah, that's true. So, uh, you know, I, uh, that's, that's a powerful uh, argument, I, because this is, it brings to mind um, Darwin himself was dependent upon paleontology revealing more missing links, and we haven't seen that take place either, right? Exactly. Yeah, we haven't. And, and then th this was also had something to do with the simple cell in the sense that they used to think it was simple, but now we recognize it's far too complex in order to uh, be something that could have happened by accident or through uh, random uh, natural processes. That's true. The cell is widely recognized is the most complex machine in the entire universe. And so and the, the basis of life, of course, is the cell. And you have to have a cell to get life going. And evolutionists recognize that you're not going to evolve a cell by mutations and natural selection, etc. And so therefore, many leading evolutionists say that life came from some other place. Exobiogenesis, they call that. And therefore, it came from Mars or came from somewhere else. The problem is it doesn't solve the problem. It just puts it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So how did it evolve on Mars or, or somewhere else? Well, they can't explain. They have the same problem. So it doesn't solve the problem. It just moves it somewhere else. Gotcha. Dr. Bergman, um, we are just about out of time here. I just really want to thank you so much for coming on the program. You've been a huge blessing. It's great to be on. Absolutely. You know, um, if you're listening today... Uh, you know, one of the things I hear, you know, when you're talking to a relative or you're talking to somebody, they always want to hear the credentials of the person you're referencing. And um, it's always nice when you have somebody like Dr. Jerry Bergman, who has so many credentials, it would take hours to read them all. And uh, you can just push this aside that that uh, he's not an expert in biology or he's not an expert in genetics or he's not an expert in whatever it is, because uh, Dr. Bergman is pretty much an expert in everything. So um, take advantage of his life experience and his education. Please check him out. Um, you can get all his books on Amazon. Just type J Dr. Jerry Bergman in there. And uh, Dr. Bergman, you're available for speaking engagements also? Oh, yeah. I just was out in California uh, a week ago, and I will be out there uh, soon. Fantastic. Uh, so if you're listening and you're a pastor or you're a parishioner who... Uh, wants to share with your pastor an awesome uh, scientist who loves God and who, who can really um, clearly articulate the truth uh, and that science actually validates the biblical worldview, um, please take a, the opportunity to uh, look up Dr. Jerry Bergman. Uh, thanks again, uh, Dr. Bergman. And uh, for those of you listening, we'll be back again next week. We're going to be actually uh, streaming uh, Bethany Hamilton live. You can check us out on Facebook or YouTube or Periscope, um, all the different social media outlets. We'll also be um, airing that interview later that week. And so um, you, can, you can get all that information that you need. Thanks for being with us. I hope you have a fantastic weekend and uh, God bless you. Did you miss part of today's program? Don't worry, we're committed to helping you get the info you need. Okay, that was dumb. But for real, visit educateforlife.com for podcasts and video recordings of the show and to sign up for the School of Unshakable Faith. Leave us your comments, compliments, questions, or concerns at 800-243-96.